Good morning. Uh, William C. Harris is a professor emeritus of history at North Carolina State University and author of three books on Lincoln, two more than I have authored, so I'm somewhat envious. Uh, his most recent book is Lincoln's Rise to the Presidency, an excellent biography of the pre-presidential Lincoln. We have a few of those, uh, and this one is as good as any uh, to start with on the very important years of uh, Lincoln and what made him or prepared him for uh, the presidency, and I believe there are still a few copies available uh, outside. Uh, my one comment uh, this morning, though, before we bring our speaker up, is on an earlier book that he wrote, which I think was uh, uh, quite good uh, and the best on its subject, uh, and its title is With Charity for All, Lincoln and the Restoration of the Union. And what Professor Harris pulls off amazingly in this book is a book about Lincoln where Lincoln does not play the major role. Uh, Lincoln plays, if you will, uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern to the hamlet, which is the southern states where Lincoln is trying to cultivate uh, southern union sentiment uh, in favor of preserving the union. Uh, and uh, therewith, uh, this book demonstrates how Lincoln tried to restore his preferred term or reconstruct the union while the Civil War was progressing. It wasn't a policy that he developed later in his presidency. And so I recommend that book uh, heartily to you. Uh, but this morning, his presentation will be on Lincoln and the Mexican War Revisited. Please welcome Professor William C. Harris. Thank you so much, uh, Lucas. Uh, it's indeed an honor to be uh, sandwiched in between Gabor uh, Boret and uh, William Miller. Uh, two scholars who have made, uh, who have meant so much uh, to to the study uh, of, of Abraham Lincoln, and also to be introduced by a distinguished rising scholar, uh, Lucas uh, Morell. Uh, this presentation uh, is mainly an offshoot of material in my book, Lincoln's Rise to the Presidency. I have also added uh, conclusions regarding the influence of Lincoln's Mexican-American War experience. Uh, on his response to Southern secession and the Civil War. On December 22, 1847, three weeks after taking his seat, freshman Whig Congressman Abraham Lincoln rose in the U.S. House of Representatives and offered a series of eight resolutions. He boldly demanded that Democratic President James K. Polk inform the House the spot on American soil where the blood of U.S. troops had been shed by Mexican troops. That incident had created the administration's justification for the war with Mexico. Lincoln and his fellow Whigs, who also protested the president's explanation for the war, questioned Polk's contention that the Rio Grande, near where the attack on American troops occurred, was the correct border between the two countries. The resolution soon became known as Lincoln's Spot Resolutions, and along with a speech on January 12, denouncing the President's action, triggered a condemnation of Lincoln in his central Illinois district, where support for the war was strong. Lincoln's opposition to the war almost cost him his political career. Most American wars, with a notable exception of World War II after Pearl Harbor, have spawned vigorous dissent and bitter partisan divisions. Significant opposition usually develops after the war begins when casualties mount, home sacrifices rise, and the conflict becomes long with no end in sight. Constitutional issues, especially over wartime powers, assume grave importance. The Mexican-American War, despite the remarkable success of American arms in a conflict that lasted less than two years, proved no exception in generating strong anti-war sentiment. When Lincoln ran for Congress in 1846, the Mer Mexican-American War had just begun. James Knox Polk, a Democrat, had won the presidency in 1844 on an expansionist platform. After the annexation of Texas in 1845 and negotiations with Mexico over a number of issues had failed, President Polk dispatched troops under General Zachary Taylor into the region between the Rio Nuecas and the Rio Grande to sustain the American claim to the area. Usually forgotten in accounts of the war's origins, 
was the fact that Mexico had never recognized the independence of Texas, had made plans to retake the province, and had announced that American annexation of Texas was a cause for war. The disputes between the two countries, however, does not excuse Pope's aggressive action, along with those of Spread Eagle Democrats in both North and South that led to war. Though commonly believed by many anti-slavery Northerners and historians, Southern desire to expand slavery into the Southwest was not an important factor in the decision for war. Neither did Lincoln believe that this was the case. Lincoln later noted that 37 slaveholders in Congress voted for a resolution condemning the war. After news of fighting between Taylor's forces and the Mexican army in the disputed area reached Washington in early May 1846, Polk immediately asked Congress not for a declaration of war as the Constitution required, but for a resolution recognizing that a state of war already existed because of Mexico's military actions. Democrats in Congress, a majority, obediently introduced uh, such a resolution. They also sought to ram through Congress an important amendment to the resolution that provided for an expanded volunteer army and $10 million to support the troops. The amendment placed Whig war opponents in a difficult position, which the Democrats hoped to exploit. Whigs, who constituted a substantial uh, minority, wanted to vote against the war resolution. But if they failed to show their support for the troops in the field by opposing the funding amendment, their patriotism would be questioned and their political careers would be in jeopardy. Infuriated by Democratic tactics and Pope's misleading justification for the war, Whigs, joined by South Carolina Senator John C. Calhoun, unsuccessfully attempted to separate the funding provision from the resolution recognizing the war's existence. In the end, almost all of the Whig dissidents, as well as Calhoun, went with their political survival instincts and voted for the amended war resolution. On May 13, 1846, it passed by a vote of 40 to 2 in the Senate and 174 to 14 in the House. Lincoln was not in this Congress yet. He would be in the next one. Whigs in Congress were left with a bitter taste in their mouths regarding the war's origins. Their opposition to Mr. Polk's war, as they called it, increased during the war and contributed to the intensification of the sectional conflict over slavery in the territories to be gained from Mexico. Nonetheless, in the beginning, patriotic sentiment for the war swept the country, especially in the South and in the West, today's Midwest. Abraham Lincoln at first was caught up a bit in the enthusiasm. In Illinois, on May 30, he attended and spoke at a bipartisan rally in Springfield called to encourage the enlistment of volunteers to fight in Mexico. Lincoln, who was the Whig candidate for, president, for, for Congress in his district, and other speakers, according to the Sangamon General, Journal, gave warm, thrilling, and effective war speeches in support of the American cause. Lincoln probably could not have known at the time of the bitter controversy in Congress over President Polk's action and Democratic tactics in securing the quick approval of the war resolution with the funding amendment. At some times later, he learned of the Democratic slay of hand in the passage of the resolution, which greatly angered him. In a letter to Usher Linda in March 1848, Lincoln declared that this action of the Loco Focos Democrats compelled the Demo Whigs to speak out and tell the truth about their foul, villainous, and bloody falsehood maneuver on the war resolution, as he called it. Lincoln, in a January 12, 1848 speech in the House of Representatives, admitted, however, that in the beginning of the war, he believed that those who could not conscientiously approve the conduct of the president, including himself, should remain silent on that point, at least till the war should be ended. He told House members that he adhered to this policy until he took his seat in, the, in Congress and discovered that the President and his friends would not allow it to be so. In the campaign for Congress in 1848, Lincoln had said little about the war, probably due to the fact that the Illinois Whigs and Democrats supported the conflict. Indeed, his two Whig rivals, 
Edward Baker and John Hardin had formed regiments and left for Mexico. Only one report of the Lincoln speech during the campaign has survived. In this speech, Lincoln stressed the Whig argument for a national economic program and, according to the newspaper report, closed with some observations on the Mexican War, annexation of Texas, and, Oregon annexation question, and the Oregon annexation question. The 13th Congress did not convene for its first session until December 1847, 16 months after Lincoln's election. Some of his friends wondered how he would do among the political elite in Washington. After the reception at the Lincoln home, Judge David Davis wrote his uh, wife, you can't make a gentleman in his outward appearance out of Lincoln to save your life. Mary Lincoln planned also to go to Washington with the objective, Davis suggested, of smoothing over some of her husband's rough social edges. She never completely succeeded, by the way. Meanwhile, opposition to the war had grown, especially among anti-slavery Whigs of the Upper North who perceived a Southern conspiracy to, sl to seize sl slave property in the war. The Wilmot Proviso, introduced into Congress in August 1846 and designed to prohibit slavery in the territories that might be gained from Mexico, reflected this northern Whig sentiment. David Wilmot, however, uh, was a dissident uh, Democrat, not a Whig. The proviso, which was attached to a military appropriations bill, ignited a firestorm of protest from Southerners of both parties. Though it passed the House of Representatives, it failed in the Senate. It would be repeatedly introduced, sometimes in a different form, only to be defeated. At first, Lincoln expressed his displeasure at the interjection of the slavery issue into Whig politics. He believed, with some justification, that the failure of radical anti-slavery Whigs in New York to support Henry Clay in 1848 had cost the party the presidency. Still, as he wrote a friend in 1845, we should never knowingly lend ourselves directly or indirectly to prevent slavery from dying a natural death, to find new places for it to live in where it can no longer exist in the old. Lincoln, along with Mary and the children, left for Washington in the fall of 1847, making a stop at Lexington, Kentucky, to visit Mary's family. When he arrived in Lexington in late October, the war had reached a climax with the capture of Mexico City by American forces in September. Peace negotiations in the Mexican capital, however, had faltered, partly because of President Polk's demand for territorial indemnities to pay for the Ameri for American war costs. The war seemed far from over. American troops appeared bogged down in Mexico and in danger of becoming an occupation army in a hostile country. The war's increased financial burdens also had deepened the concern of Americans who had traditionally opposed heavy federal expenditures. On November 13, while still in Lexington, Lincoln heard Whig leader Henry Clay deliver an important speech on the war. Clay issued a blistering attack on Polk's war policy and the failure to end the conflict without territorial indemnities. Lincoln must have been greatly influenced by the speech of his bold ideal of a candidate as he referred to Clay. He later advanced, though usually in different words, some of the same anti-war arguments that Clay expressed in his Lexington speech. When Congress convened on December 6th, Lincoln was a junior member of the party that now held a narrow majority in the House of Representatives. Democrats still control the Senate. The day after Congress convened, President Polk's annual message was read in the House. Polk, as he had done in previous messages to Congress, outlined his reasons for the war. He also announced that peace negotiations had stalemated on the issue of Mexican indemnities for causing the war. Since Mexico was bankrupt, Polk demanded California and New Mexico as satisfactory indemnity payments. Both provinces had been invaded by U.S. troops during the war. If the Mexican government remained obstinate on this issue, Polk promised that the United States would continue to occupy the Mexican heartland and require harsher peace terms. He also rejected the Whig proposal that American troops withdraw to a defensive line this would only encourage the enemy to persevere, persevere, Polk argued. 
Whig leaders in Congress, along with Senator Calhoun, immediately condemned the president's terms. Calhoun declared that to conquer and retain large areas of Mexico violated American tradition and would overthrow our system of government. On the other hand, Manifest Destiny, our expansionist Democrats, defended Polk's message. The lines were thus drawn in, co in the Congress for a vigorous debate on the war soon after Lincoln took his seat in the House. On December 20, Illinois Democrat William A. Richardson offered the free resolution supporting Polk's contention that the war was just and necessary on American part and that Mexico's rejection of the president's territorial indemnity terms warranted the continuation of the war. The Whig-controlled House voted to adjourn in order to avoid taking action on Richardson's resolution. This would also give the Whigs time for in the introduction of counter-resolutions. The next day, several Whigs offered resolutions attacking Pope's policy and Richardson's resolutions. And to this mix of resolutions and speeches, Abraham Lincoln rose in the House on December 22 and proposed what became known as his spot resolutions. It was an, an audacious move for a freshman representative who had only taken his seat less than three weeks earlier. Lincoln later explained his action in a January 12 speech in the House. He declared that after Richardson introduced his resolution, he was compelled to decide immediately how he would vote on the war. I went about preparing myself to give the vote understandingly when it should come, Lincoln said. I carefully examined the president's messages to ascertain what he himself had said and proved upon this point. The result of the examination was that Pope fell far short of proving his justification for the war. Lincoln's explanation, however, was disingenuous. He had already determined, even without a careful examination of the issue, that he would vote against any resolution supporting the president's policy. The Whigs in the House had voted as a unit in delaying action on the Richardson resolutions. Richardson's action, as Richardson's action, as Lincoln explained, motivated him to introduce the Spots resolution and to begin preparing a de detailed case against President Polk's war policy. A desire for political influence also influenced Lincoln's decision to enter the debate on the war. In a letter to William H. Herndon soon after taking his seat in the House, Lincoln suggested that he was determined to make a name for himself in Congress. Left unsaid in the letter was Lincoln's realization that no better way existed for him to advance his political standing than in a well-thought-out challenge to Polk's policy on the floor of the House. Lincoln's spot, spot resolutions demanded that President Polk provide the House of Representatives with information on where the fighting began. House members, he insisted, needed the information in order for them to have a full knowledge of all the facts which go to establish whether the particular soil, spot of soil on which the blood of our citizens was or was not our soil at the time. Lincoln, as Herndon later wrote, realized that even if his resolutions passed the House, Pope would not respond with the documentary information that he sought. The Illinois congressman's resolutions were rhetorical interrogatives and in accus accusatory in tone, a technique he would use in his famous debate with Douglas at Freeport in 1858. Lincoln suggested that the area between the Rio Nuecas and the, near the Rio Grande, where American troops were attacked, was not American territory. His resolutions were designed to show the falsehood of Polk's justification for the war. Wisely, in view of his overriding concern for national Whig uh, unity, Lincoln kept his focus on the origins of the conflict and avoided the slavery issue that the Wilmot Proviso had triggered. Lincoln thought that his approach would gain the support of Southern Whigs while satisfying Northern Whigs who, despite their anti-slavery sentiments, wanted to maintain the unity of the, of the party. Lincoln's spot resolutions were not acted upon by the House. Meanwhile, the debate on the war continued. On January 5, George Ashman, a Whig representative from Massachusetts, moved to amend the resolution expressing appreciation to General Taylor for his service in the war. In my book, I say that this was a, uh, a resolution by Ashman, but actually it was an amendment 
to a resolution. So I stand corrected in the book. Ashman added the phrase, in a war unnecessarily and unconstitutionally begun by the President of the United States. The amendment immediately passed the House by a strict party vote, with, Whigs, with Lincoln joining Whigs from both North and South in supporting uh, the Ashman resolution uh, amendment. The Democratic-controlled Senate, as expected, rejected the Ashman Amendment. In his January 12 speech, Lincoln charged that President Polk had stooped to the sheerest deception by employing every artifice to work around, befog, and cloud, cover up with many words to justify his flawed policy. Lincoln meticulously challenged the President's central point in justifying the war. That is, that the Rio Grande, where American troops had been am ambushed, was a border between the two countries. Lincoln, as his spot resolutions had suggested, contended that the Rio Grande had never been recognized as a boundary. Still, in a convoluted and somewhat contradictory argument that perhaps only his fellow lawyers in the House uh, could appreciate, Lincoln admitted that the Rio Nuecas, which Mexico claimed as a boundary, might not be the rightful border after all. He later explained to editor Horace Greeley of the New York Tribune that Texas authority extended to American settlements below the New Acres, but not anywhere near the Rio Grande at any point. Having, having challenged the president's justification for the war, Lincoln then launched into a sharp attack on Polk's miscalculation of an easy victory. Characterizing the president's last annual message to Congress on the war as the insane mumblings of a fever dream, Lincoln claimed that Pope now finds himself he knows not where. The president, Lincoln said, continues to be inconsistent in his explanations of how the conflict began and how it was to be financed. As to the mode of terminating the war and securing peace, the president is equally wandering and indefinite. Lincoln told his colleagues, first, it is to be done by a vigorous prosecution of the war in the vital parts of the enemy's country. After talking himself tired on this point, Polk tells us that with the Mexican people distracted and divided by contending factions and a government subject to constant changes by successful revolutions, the continued success of our army may fail to secure a satisfactory peace. According to Lincoln, Polk said that it might be necessary to have the Amer Mexican people desert their leaders and, and protected by the American army, set up a government from which we can secure a satisfactory peace. The President Lincoln claimed had resolved that Mexico should cede, in addition to California and New Mexico, all of the country as an indemnity for the expense of the war, though Polk insists that the separate national existence of Mexico shall be maintained, according to Lincoln. This, Lincoln suggested, was obviously a false economy. Lincoln contended that Polk and his misguided actions had hoped to escape scrutiny by fixing the public gaze upon the exceeding brightness of military glory, that attractive rainbow that rises in showers of blood, that serpent's eye that charms to destroy. Clay had said something similar early in Lexington, where, and Lincoln sort of picked up on that, but it was not the same word. Lincoln concluded that Pope's mind had been taxed beyond its power. He was a bewildered, confounded, and miserably perplexed man who had led America into a needless and unfortunate war. Lincoln's spot resolutions and his January 12 speech received little attention in Washington and in the national press. More prominent Whigs had made similar speeches against Pope's war policy, though not with the precision of Lincoln's argument. Lincoln characterized an anti-war speech by a slim, little slim, pale-minded, consumptive man from Georgia, Alexander H. Stevens, as the best one that he had heard. He later wrote, he, he wrote Herndon that the address moved him to tears. Democrat John Jamerson of Missouri was the only congressman who took much notice of Lincoln's speech on the floor of the House. Jameson found it astounding that the gentleman from Illinois could make such an unpatriotic speech while troops from his state were dying and suffering in Mexico. Though largely unnoticed elsewhere, Lincoln had raised a firestorm at home. 
the Springfield State Register led the assault on him. This Democratic newspaper characterized the spot resolutions as treason and announced that the brand of Benedict Arnold is upon Lincoln's forehead and the damned spot will not wear out. Other Illinois Democrats joined in the chorus of denunciation, predicting that Lincoln would have a fearful account for settled with the state heroes when they returned from Mexico. Illinois Whigs also were displeased with their only representative in Congress, but they kept publicly quiet. Herndon warned Lincoln of Whig unhappiness with him and expressed his own disagreement with, the law, with his law partner's opinions that the war was wrong. He particularly uh, criticized Lincoln's support of the Ashman uh, Amendment. Lincoln responded to Herndon with two revealing letters in defense of his position. On February 1, he told Herndon that the Ashman Amendment affirms that the war was unnecessarily and unconstitutionally commenced by the president, and I will stake my life that if you had been in my place, you have, would have voted just as I did. Lincoln also maintained that he was compelled to speak against what he knew was a lie, that's the word he used, lie by Pope and his Democratic friends that the war was just and necessary. He also responded to the Democratic charge that, along with other Whigs, in opposing the war, had voted against provisions for the Army. Lincoln indignantly wrote Herndon that his criticism of the war had nothing to do in determining my votes on the question of supplies. I have always intended and still intend to vote supplies, perhaps not in the precise form recommended by the President, but in a better form for all purposes, purposes except local folk party purposes. Lincoln probably meant that he opposed amendments to Army spending bills designed to facilitate the acquisitions of large areas in Mexico. The Whigs, Lincoln insisted, from the beginning, made and kept the distinction between Polk's war and support for the Army. Two weeks later, in a second letter to Herndon, Lincoln sought to refute another of his partner's contentions. He denied Herndon's statement that the president could invade a neighboring nation whenever he shall deem it necessary to repel an invasion and thus make war at pleasure. If the president could launch such a pre preemptive strike, there would be no limit to his power of intervention, Lincoln argued. The founding fathers, Lincoln said, gave the war-making power to Congress because kings had always been involving and impoverishing their people in wars, pretending generally, if not always, that the good of the people was the object. The, the founders framed, as Lincoln said, the Constitution that no one man should hold the power of bringing this oppression upon us. Lincoln told Herndon that your view destroys the whole matter and places our president where kings have always stood. Meanwhile, Lincoln had joined a group of young Whigs in Congress, including Alexander H. Stevens, to provoke the candidacy of General Taylor for president. Lincoln supported Taylor, a war hero, not because he would be a better president than party leader Henry Clay, as he explained, but because he was the only candidate who could de defeat the Democrats. Lincoln wished fully to claim that Taylor supported the Whig defensive line strategy for ending the war and also other Whig policies. This defensive line strategy, if adopted, would establish a boundary on the Rio Grande and elsewhere in the Southwest where American forces had gained a firm foothold. Though it might be necessary to obtain some territory from Mexico, Lincoln did not want the United States to acquire any extending so far south as to enlarge and aggravate the distracting question of slavery triggered by the Wilmot Proviso. The defensive line strategy was designed to counter Polk's territorial indemnity demand on Mexico that Whigs feared meant the seizure of all of the country and, in, and the inevitable continuation of the war. The United States, Lincoln and other Whigs insisted, should pay for any land acquired in the Southwest. By the time of the presidential election of 1848, terms for the end of the war had become a moot issue. The peace treaty signed in Guadalupe Hidalgo had been ratified by the Senate. Mexico agreed to the Rio Grande as the Texas boundary and ceded New Mexico and California to the United States, receiving in return $15 million and an agreement by the Washington government to assume the claims of American citizens against the American government. 
Now that the war was over, Lincoln hoped that his support for the popular Taylor in the election would overcome his own sudden unpopularity in Illinois, and he would be renominated for Congress. He was wrong. Whigs in his district bypassed the man of spots, as the Democrats derisively labeled him, and chose Stephen T. Logan as their candidate. Years later, in an autobiography for his 1860 presidential bid, Lincoln claimed that he did not seek re-election because of an understanding among he did not seek re-election because of an understanding among his Whig friends, of uh, James uh, Jake Hardin and Edward D. Baker and himself, that the rotation principle applied to the congressional seat. However, the likelihood of the rotation agreement still being in force was remote. Hardin had died a hero in Mexico, and Baker had moved outside of Lincoln's district. Though Taylor won the presidency, Logan lost the congressional election. Judge David Davis blamed Logan's defeat on Lincoln's momentary uh, unpopularity. Herndon also concluded that the spot resolution sealed Lincoln's doom as a congressman and cost the Whigs a district in 1848. Lincoln's opposition to the Mexican War came back to haunt him when he ran for the Senate in 1858, and to a lesser extent in the presidential election of 1860. Though not a major issue of 1858, slavery was the main issue, Douglas and fellow Democrats repeatedly reminded voters of Lincoln's position on the war and in the process embellished his record. The Chicago Times, for example, reached demagogic heights when it told its readers that Lincoln had voted against the purchase of medicines and employment of nurses to attend the sick and dying American soldiers in the hospitals and camps of burning Mexico. There are more quotes like this, but uh, I don't have time to, to, to uh, give them. Not wanting to dignify such attacks by a personal response to the newspapers, Lincoln asked his friends in the Republican press to answer the Democratic lie, as he called it. In a letter to Chicago editor Joseph Medell, Lincoln acknowledged that he had opposed the war, but he insisted there's not a word of truth in the charge that he had voted against provisions for the Army. Lincoln informed Medell that he had re-examined the journals of the House of Representatives and could find nothing in his votes that suggested that he had denied any support for the men in the field. Lincoln provided Medell with the specific citations in the Congressional Journal proving his case. In its blind rage to assail me, Lincoln angrily wrote, the Douglas Press had seized on a vague recollection of his predecessor's vote against the provision in bill. His predecessor was Whig, Whig John Henry, uh, who was serving out the term of Baker after he had resigned to command an Illinois regiment. I well remember how astounded and mortified I was, Lincoln told Medell, when I first learned of Henry's vote against provisions. I scarcely think anyone is quite vile enough to make such a charge against me without some slight belief in the truth of it. As Lincoln had requested, Medell and other Republican editors immediately came to his defense. The Springfield, Illinois State Journal characterized the Mexican-American War acquisition, uh, accusations as a black-hearted falsehood and base misrepresentation illustrated with vile epithets and cowardly billingsgate to foster up Mr. Douglas's winning fortunes, waning fortunes. Despite the Republican press's efforts to set Lincoln's war record straight, Democrats continued their attacks. In the historic debates of 1858, Senator Douglas, though forced to admit that Lincoln had not voted against supplies for the Army, charged that his opponent, in supporting the anti-war Ashman Amendment, took the side of a common enemy against his own country. In Congress, as a representative of his state, Douglas told the crowd at Freeport in the second debate that Lincoln, uh, with Lincoln that Lincoln declared the Mexican War to be unjust and infamous and would not support it or acknowledge his own country to be right in the contest because he said that American blood was not shed on American soil in the right spot. Upset by Lincoln's attack on his war record, Lincoln at Charleston in the fourth debate struck back by labeling, labeling it a lie, which did not deter the little giant from continuing to raise the war issue. And I have quotes that I don't have time to, to give here from that. It is impossible to determine if the Mexican-American war charged against Lincoln contributed to his loss. 
more precisely the defeat of Republican legislative candidates in the 1858 election. Though the slavery question was paramount in the contest, the war issue could have made the difference in the closely contested central counties where voters remembered the sacrifices of local war heroes like John J. Hardin, who was killed at Cerro Gordo. In 1860, Douglas Democrats again warmed over the old chestnut of Lincoln's opposition to the war with Mexico. The usual suspects, the Springfield, Illinois State Register and the Chicago Times, led the attack on the Republican presidential candidate's war record. Lincoln and the state Republican press, however, ignored the attack the attack, lest it provide the Democrats with an excuse to keep the matter alive. In the end, the war issue had no appreciable effect on the presidential election, except perhaps to reinforce stalwart Democratic opposition to Lincoln in his home state, Illinois. Abraham Lincoln's experience in Congress taught him several valuable lessons, particularly in regard to the Mexican-American War. Lincoln learned that he, as well as his party, must respect the majority sentiments of his constituents. Lincoln's ill-fated term in Congress reinforced his view that restraint in pursuing principles should be carefully practiced if he and his party hoped to win elections. This became clear in his adoption of a successful conservative strategy against slavery during the 1850s. In addition, Lincoln's distaste for Mr. Polk's war caused him to conclude that Americans should not be drawn into a military conflict for partisan and unnecessary reasons, and all efforts should be made to avoid war. Lincoln believed that only vital national interest issues could not be resolved and Republican principles maintained should the nation go to war. Unlike in the Mexican-American War, the president, Lincoln learned, should carefully and truthfully explain to the people the national objectives in the war. Though, though strategic military changes might be necessary, the stated war objectives should be adhered to throughout the conflict. Lincoln's Mexican-American War experience influenced his response to Southern secession and the Civil War. In his inaugural address on March 4, 1861, after seven states had seceded, Lincoln plainly affirmed his constitutional duty to ex execute the federal laws and hold, occupy, and possess the property and places belonging to the government and to collect the duties and imposts. This meant using whatever means necessary to suppress those who refused to obey the law and had, and had usurped the legitimate authority of the government. Though Lincoln longed for peace in 1861, war came. On April 12, in Charleston Harper, the seceded states chose war to the acceptance of Lincoln's conditions. As if determined to avoid President Polk's mistakes, Lincoln, on July 4, in his first message to Congress, went to great lengths to explain the events leading to the fighting. He provided a detailed historical argument why secession was unconstitution, unconstitutional and should not be tolerated the best uh, explanation or argument I have seen on this issue. He also indicated the measures he had taken after the war began. He said that his actions were constitutionally justified in view of the immediate danger to the government. He clearly said that his purpose in the war was to save the Union. Lincoln declared that the statement in his inaugural address of the powers and duties of the federal government relatively to the rights of the states and the people under the Constitution would not change after the rebellion shall have been suppressed. He told Congress on July 4th in the same message that he intended to preserve the government that it may be administered for all as it was administered by the men who made it. Finally, Lincoln placed the Union cause on a higher universal plane than Polk had placed the Mexican-American War. The issue in the war, he asserted, embraces more than the fate of the United States. It, it presents to the whole family of man the question whether a constitutional republic or a democracy, a government of the people, by the people, can or cannot maintain its territorial integrity against its own domestic foes. But if the government cannot sustain itself, it practically puts an end to free government upon the earth. 
Though it is commonly believed that Lincoln in his Emancipation Proclamation changed the Union objective in going to war, actually, emancipation was both a strategic move and a means to fulfill the important political principles that he announced on July 4, 1861. In his last message to Congress on December 6, 1864, Lincoln reaffirmed that the common end in the war was the maintenance of the Union, and among the means to secure that end was the destruction of slavery. Lincoln had acted against the immoral institution that, as he had argued before the Civil War, prevented America from fulfilling the noble ideals of its founders, ideals undermined by President Polk's foreign adventure and territorial aggrandizement. An important reason for Abraham Lincoln's remarkable success was his willingness and ability to benefit from the mistakes of the past. His Mexican-American War experience is an overlooked case in point. Thank you. Yes. Don't go away. Okay. <laughs> All right. Questions for Dr. Harris? And we'll go over to the microphone, if you would, please. So, because if we, we want to get you on the record here. <laughs> but not me on the record. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you too. Anyway, uh, some of the rest of you are going to ask questions. It might be well to move to the mics, if you would. and, and, and Go ahead. Well, that's true, but uh, the Whigs did not want uh, the uh, uh, Wilmot, Wilmot Proviso. Uh, they, they voted against it, with a few exceptions, and it was political disaster for those who, who voted uh, for the Wilmot Proviso in the South. That is, Whigs. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the understanding is that the, uh, that the uh, Missouri Compromise Line just extended to American territory at that time, the Louisiana Purchase, and not to the vast Southwest that would be acquired uh, in, in, in this. Now, a good many Whigs were a little, uh, uh, didn't get quite as upset with the Wilmot Proviso, but in the end they voted against it. It was, a, it was either that or perhaps political suicide. For two Whigs in North Carolina, it was political suicide. They voted uh, uh, for the Wilmot Proviso, as, as I recall, and, uh, and they were not reelected to, 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 to Congress. Next question. <laughs> okay, uh, the Whigs referred to, at that time, referred to the Democrats as local focos. Uh, uh, in New York, uh, there were two factions of Democrats. Uh, I believe, well, the barn burners, and who was the other, and, uh, uh, but the, the hunkers. And uh, uh, they were meeting, uh, one of the groups was meeting, and uh, the, the uh, uh, the gas was turned off and something, so they went to these local foco matches, which was uh, right, uh, was just on the market not too long before. And so the, in derision, the first, the, I, I think it was the hunkers that referred to them as uh, local focos, but then the Whigs picked up on that. It, it, it's one of those nice little phrases that you can use against your political opponent. And Lincoln routinely used that, but I don't recall Lincoln using that uh, in the uh, Lincoln Douglas debates or, or after that, he, uh, uh, he might have. Dr. Harris, yes, here. <laughs> thank oh, you, yeah. thank you for this wealth of information and data on this period of uh, life. It was uh, truly extraordinary. Uh, two questions: uh, Your usual sources, did they have congressional record then, or depend mainly, or something similar, depend mainly on letters and? news accounts and the like. And second, uh, prompted by uh, some things happening today, uh, 
Uh, what was Mayor Todd Lincoln's influence on his life as far as uh, the, the decisions or the debates? Uh, she was certainly trying to take his rough hewn edges off. Well, first, there was the Congressional Globe, which yes. was the predecessor okay. of the Congressional Record, but it was sort of sketchy, too. But you get a good bit of information from newspapers and, and letters as well. In terms of Mary Todd Lincoln, uh, uh, I'm a little more sympathetic to her, uh, in, uh, especially in the, before, the, before Lincoln became president, because he, uh, she had some, I think, influence on, his, uh, on him, and she, he talked to her about, about things as, as well. Uh, she certainly tried to refine his taste, and, uh, uh, because he, Lincoln was a pretty shrewd fellow uh, for, uh, in his early years, and uh, I think she... Uh, uh, she helped a great deal in, 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 in that regard, and she entertained, and she was, she was good at that. Uh, of course, they had their problems in their marriage that we don't have to go into here, yes. but uh, Michael Burlingame has written about, uh, about this extensively, too, and, uh, and, it's, and it's true. Uh, I think I did not answer the one part over here, too, yeah, and that you. was on the spread eagle Democrats. Spread Eagle uh, Democrats. These are the words that's been used that uh, expansionist, expansionist Democrats. They will manifest destiny. It's America's manifest destiny uh, to, to expand. That's, uh, uh, that's the idea. And Stephen A. Douglas was one of these, by the way, <laughs> whereas, of course, Lincoln was not. Lincoln thought that American ideals uh, could be, uh, could go to uh, other countries, could pick up on American ideals, but not. Uh, through force or anything like that, not through expansion. Yeah, just a quick comment and a question. I was thanking you for your lecture. I was always wondering why Lincoln never served a second term in Congress. I think you sort of outlined that today. My question is, um, was slavery outlawed in Mexico when the war began? And I'll just put, no, listen for your answer. Uh, yes, yes, it was in Mexico. Uh, but uh, there, uh, of course, uh, it was honored in the breach in some places. Now, in Texas, of course, there was slavery. Uh, and, uh, but Texas is a province. Earlier, there was some provision for, for ending slavery. I don't recall the details uh, offhand when it was a Mexican uh, province much, much earlier. But most, southern, most of the settlers, Anglo settlers in Mexico, in Texas, uh, were Southerners from Tennessee, uh, Louisiana, and so on, and of course Sam Houston's example. And so they, uh, uh, they uh, uh, slavery became a part of uh, became a part of that of the scene there, uh, very much a part. Here's a question. Okay. With Professor, uh, with um, President Polk dying so shortly after his presidency, did. Lincoln ever say anything about Polk after Polk's presidency, or is he silent on Polk and his presidency after? I think he's silent on Polk. I haven't seen anything. Some of the others who are, 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 are more familiar with, you know, all the works of Lincoln might. But I, I've seen nothing regarding Polk uh, uh, later in Lincoln's works. Uh, uh. Okay. Yes. Yes, sir. Sir, question regarding Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. To what extent do you think Frederick Douglass had influenced Lincoln in, in allowing black troops to, to fight on the side of the North? Well, I will begin by saying that there's an excellent book out by James Oates now on Lincoln and, and, and uh, Frederick Douglass. Uh, and I would recommend uh, uh, that book. Uh, uh, the, uh, it was in August of, uh, of 1864, as I recall, in one of my earlier books, with Charity for All, I, I think I mentioned this and others have too, that Douglass did meet with Lincoln. Uh, and Lincoln wanted to get as many slaves out of the Confederate hell area uh, uh, before the end of the war because, because he thought that, that the Emancipation Proclamation would not be constitutional if the, when the war ended, unless you've got a constitutional amendment, of course. Uh, it's one reason why he moved heaven and earth to get the constitutional amendment. So I don't... Uh, uh, but nothing came of that, really. Nothing came of that uh, effort to move slaves out. But they were moving themselves in many cases, like in the Mississippi Valley. Uh, 
in Confederate held territory, they simply were fleeing uh, Confederate, uh, Confederate lines uh, and going to Union lines where they were not always uh, welcome, but uh, they, they were more welcomed in the South Atlantic area, I think, where you have New England troops, uh, that is, slaves. And of course, they uh, became soldiers, many of them became soldiers. Did, did he, can, can I just finish, it's part of it. Do you, do you feel that Lincoln felt that the entrance of the black troops into the, in, into the battleground, uh, or Douglas, uh, helped to bring about the end of the war? Well, Douglas uh, both, both, both felt uh, that, I think. Uh, uh, historians are not in, in agreement on this, uh, uh, but uh, they certainly fought for freedom, and, uh, and uh, that made a difference in the morale in, uh, in, the, in the Union Army as well uh, in terms of emancipation they, and in terms of after the war, I think, uh, uh, rights for blacks as well. If they fight, fight on our side, then they should be be free, they should have uh, certain civil, right, uh, civil Thank rights. Thank you. Okay, question? Uh, I'm not a scholar, so I will humbly submit to any corrections you might uh, make. Uh, but it seems to me that Lincoln could make a claim that not very many other members of Congress could at that time, uh, the fact that he had participated in a war. Uh, and as I recall, that was Black Hawk's War and his participation was brief, brief, and he probably didn't come under fire. But you had said that uh, the, his opposition to the Mexican War had an effect upon uh, his uh, attitude toward the Civil War. Was there anything in his participation in the earlier war that influenced his yeah. opposition to the war with Mexico? One thing, he fought a lot of mosquitoes. Uh, and, and that, but he was only, it was only a summer kind of a, a, a militia action. And, uh, and uh, uh, he took great pride in that uh, years later. He said that being elected captain of that militia company was the, uh, the most satisfying thing that, uh, had, occur that had occurred to him. Uh, and uh, he took great pride in that. Uh, but... Uh, uh, no, I don't. Uh, I don't. Uh, I don't think that this influenced his later view. There was no real, in his case, there was no real war in the uh, Black Hawk uh, uh, War. Uh, he. Uh, uh, it was only a brief period, and uh, so, uh, uh, and there was no. He didn't see any fighting in the and the militia unit that uh, he commanded, and then he enlisted after that expired. Uh, he needed the money, really. Uh, so uh, he didn't uh, uh, he didn't really take to military service very well, I don't think. But he took pride in that years later. Uh, was there another? There's a question over here. And oh yeah, over there. right. And that's the last one. Over okay. There. Thank you for your presentation. I have heard uh, earlier about uh, Lincoln's position on the Mexican American War and about the uh, uh, the Illinois Whig rotation issue. Uh, you may have already answered this in your closing remarks, but I was just wondering as a scholar watching, seeing Lincoln's position on the Mexican-American War, uh, later opposition to the uh, Spanish-American War with the main events like that, Vietnam with the Gulf of Tonkin, Iraq with uh, weapons of mass destruction. I'm just wondering if you, had, if you wanted to expand it all. Uh, if you don't, that's fine. Uh, uh, no, that's that's too big of a uh, okay. big of a topic. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, uh, history does not uh, precisely repeat itself. Uh, but uh, there are certain patterns and way people react to 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 events and constitutional issues, as I said, that that arise, like presidential powers, are still with us, aren't they? Uh, that problem. Uh, but uh, no, I please uh, excuse me from. <laughs> Uh, from commenting on that. Uh, That's the last question. Would you characterize Congress's vote in 1846 then as more a true declaration of war or more like the resolution in uh, 2002 then? Well, it was a, a resolution of Congress, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the, uh, the Spanish-American War it was a resolution to free Cuba uh, and not to annex it. Uh, and not a declaration of war uh, uh, as such. Uh, so there are 
there may be precedents for just a resolution like that, but it's the way the, Dem the, the, the Polk and the Democrats went about it, uh, too, that upset the Whigs. Uh, the Whigs were in that Congress were in a minority in the House, but they were a powerful minority, and they could get some a few uh, northern uh, Democrats to go along, too, with them in opposing the war. But when you threw that funding provision in, support the troops in the field, that's political suicide for a politician to, 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 to vote against that. And almost all the Whigs uh, recognized that in 1846. Uh, 